Hello, my name is Keshwani. That's K E S H W A N I. Keshwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GMAT. We have been solving math problems out of this book here, the GMAT Official Guide 2021. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Today we'll solve some data sufficiency problems as you can see on the blackboard data sufficiency problems that appear on page number 207 beginning with number 289 if after having watched this video you found you found it useful and if you decide that you would like to work with me that you would like to hire me as your tutor to get you ready for the GMAT you can reach me at Keshwani prep at icloud.com send me an email and we'll see what we can do number 289 again it's important that you have the book in front of you so that you can follow the problem itself properly because I'm not going to write down the entire problem. I'm just going to write down bits and pieces. So here we have range of, we are told that we have, a, we have to find the range of 30 prices. 30 prices. And our job simply is to figure out what is the range of these prices, 30 objects, 30 prices. The first one says, first one says, one third are twenty-four dollars, twenty-four dollars each. One third are twenty-four dollars each. Before we do anything at all, before we do anything at all, let's let's take charge of the situation. Let's take charge of the situation. Let's not be bloody puppets. When they tell you that we have to figure out the range of thirty prices. That doesn't mean that we have to keep it at 30. Just make it something, 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 something manageable. 30 is too many to make because because if we were to make up some numbers, we don't want to write out 30, 30 of them, do we? We just since this is talking about a third, let's pick a small sample size, which is divisible by three. And if we can't just take three observations, that'll be silly. Let's just pretend there are six of them. Let's there, let's do, let's just pretend that there are six of them. And it says here. One third of them are twenty-four dollars each. So we have twenty-four dollars. We have twenty-four dollars, and another two, another two. But again, we do not know where these twenty-four dollars fall. Maybe these two twenty-four are the highest one. Maybe they are in the middle one. But that's all we know. That's all we know. Is there enough to figure out the range of these six prices? Answer, of course, is no. Answer, of course, is no. A, D, B, C, E. The first, the first statement by itself is not sufficient. That tells us that the answer cannot be A or D. It would have to be either B, C or E. Let's look at second statement. Second statement tells us that the lowest price lowest price is equal to one third of one third of highest price. Again, simply knowing that by itself that the lowest price in the range is one third of the highest price does not enable us to ascertain what the range is. All this tells us, all this tells us that the range must be two times the lowest price. Because if the lowest price, if this is the lowest price and this is the highest price, which is three times the lowest price, all this second statement only told us is that the range, the range is simply two times the lower price, three L minus one L. But that doesn't doesn't tell us what the range is. If you put the two statements together, so the answer cannot be B. If you put the two statements together, it is still not enough. If you put the two statements together, the first statement tells us that one third the price of 24. We do not know, as we said before, as we said before, we do not know where this 24 dollar falls. If it is like the way we wrote it here, then we know that the highest price is three times this thing. In which case we can figure out the range. The range is simply going to be 24 times 2, it's 48. But what if we have a situation like this? 24 falls here. Then we cannot figure out what the range is. Or maybe the 24 is here, 24. You get the idea. We don't know. All we know is that one third of the price is in, in, in this case, because we have six observations, one third of the price is of $24 each. But we don't know which, which of these two, where the one third falls towards the one extreme or the other, or where. It doesn't know. We, we do not know. We cannot figure out the range. The answer is E. The answer is E. I always tell myself not to do something 
and this is exactly what I end up doing every single time. I always tell myself not to explain too much because we, when you begin to explain too much, it gets to be bloody boring. 290. We have three houses. We have three houses that are that are for sale on market. And they have three different prices obviously. There's a there's a house where they are asking the highest price, then there is a house which has, which is asking the lowest price of the three, and there is a house whose asking price is in the, right in the middle, somewhere between the highest and the lowest. Our job, the question is, what is the second highest price? Asking what is the second highest price is same as asking what is this guy, because that's the second highest price. That's the highest price, the second highest, and the lowest. That's what we have to figure out. This is the question mark. Let's see what the first statement tells us. First statement tells us the difference between the highest price and the middle price is $130,000. Is that enough? Simply knowing that the difference between the highest price and the middle price is $130,000, does that enable us to figure out what the middle price is? Of course not. A, D, B, C, E. First statement by itself is not enough. Let's cross out A and D, answer cannot be A or D. Let's look at second statement. While I'm looking at it, I just noticed here, this word got cropped up in the last lecture, penultimate, which simply means second to the last. If you want to learn this word properly, the meaning of the word and the word itself properly, you will find on my, ch on my channel, series of vocabulary videos. Or better yet, you can just simply go to YouTube and just type in GMAT vocabulary words, GMAT vocabulary words, day 11, and if it doesn't pop up, put my put my name next to it, Keshwani, and then GMAT, GMAT vocabulary word, day 11, and learn that word. It doesn't hurt to improve one's vocabulary while, while one is learning math. What does the second statement say? second statement says that the difference between the highest price... Oh, sorry, this was the lowest price. The first statement says the difference between the highest and the lowest price is 130. It doesn't change anything. Second statement tells us the difference between the highest price and the middle price is 85k. Again, by itself, we cannot figure out what the what the middle price is. Second statement is also not by enough. If we put them together, we'll find that that is still not enough. There is nothing in here. We need to know a lot, lot more than that. We have two equations. We need to have third equation because there are three unknown in order to figure out these things. Putting the two statements together it's also not enough. And if you like, the part that we're about to do, we don't have to do that, but if you like, this is how we can show it. This is not something we need to do for the question, we just, this is extra. This is what's going on here. Okay, so here we go. This is what's going on here. Here's the highest price, here's the middle price, here's the lowest price. The first segment tells us the difference between the highest price and lowest price is 130. The difference between the highest price and lower price is 130. So if we call the lowest price x, this would have to be x plus 130. Second statement goes on to say, tell us that the difference between the highest price and the middle price is 85. Highest price is this. Difference between this price and this price, which is p plus 130, which is the highest price, minus 85. That's, that's, your, that's your middle price. This is what we want to find out. This, this quantity is what we want to find out. Which boils down to, this should say x, this should say x not p, they should say x. And that boils down to x plus 130 plus 85, it's going to be 45 I believe. This is what it is, this is what we want to find out, the middle price. And we cannot figure out the middle price, all this tells us is that the middle price, whatever it is, is 45,000 more than the lowest price. But what is the lowest price? We don't know. Which is why the answer is E. 291. 291. 291 says that A plus B plus C A plus B plus C we are told equals 12. And the question is how much is B? Let's see what the first statement tells us. 
first statement tells us that a plus b, a plus b equals 8. a plus b equals 8. What does it tell us? Since since a plus b, since a plus b plus c, we are told is equal to 12, and a plus b is equal to 8, this quantity is 8 plus c equals 12. What this tells us is that c is equal to 4. But knowing c is equal to, so knowing that c equals 4, and the sum of a and b is 8, does not enable us to figure out what b is. The first statement, a, d, b, c, e. The first statement by itself is not enough. The answer cannot be A or D. Let's look at second statement. Second statement tells us that B plus C, B plus C is equal to 6. And now we know A plus C plus A plus B plus C we are told is 12. Now we know that B plus C is 12, B plus C is 6. So A plus 6 must be 12, which tells us that A must be 6. Again, knowing what A is does not enable us to figure out what B is because we don't know what A plus B is. If you look at only the second statement by itself, only the second statement by itself, we know what A is, but simply knowing what A is does not enable us to figure out what B is because we don't know what A plus B is. But if you put the two, 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 two together, so the answer is not B. But putting the two statements together is enough, of course, because we know what C is, we know what A is, we know what A, what A. What A is, we know what C is, we can figure out the B. The answer is C. Putting the two statements together is enough. 292. 292. 292 is simply asking, is R times W equal to 0? Is the product of R and W zero? Let's see what the first statement tells us. The first statement tells us that the R is somewhere between negative six and positive five. Is there enough to figure out whether R times W is zero? The only way the product of two numbers can be zero is that one of those two numbers is zero, or better yet, both of them are zero. What this does tells us the possibility that R may be zero because we know R is somewhere between R is somewhere between negative 5, negative 4, all the way up to 0, and then all the way up to positive 4. We know R is one of these two numbers. If R happens to be 0, if R happens to be 0, which is possible, then the answer is yes. Then the answer is yes, the product is 0. But we don't know. Maybe if, maybe if R is not equal to 0, if R happens to be one of the other numbers, then the answer is no. First statement by itself does not do the job. A, D, B, C, E. Answer cannot be A or D. What the first statement tells us is that it is possible. Is R time W equal to zero? The answer is not necessarily so, based on what we are told in the first statement. Not necessarily so. Let's look at second statement. Second statement tells us Second statement tells us that W is between 6 and 10. Again, when we're looking at second statement, we look at only the second statement, we do not look at the first statement. Knowing that W is between this and that, we know W is not equal to 0. This tells us that W is not equal to 0. So the only way R times W can be 0 is, is R equal to 0. But we do not know if R is equal to 0 or not based on second statement. Second statement is not enough by itself. Now when we put them together, we get back to square one, we already established that the first statement, what we know in the first statement, all we can tell is that R may be zero. Well, maybe zero is not same as is zero. So two statements together also does not enable us to give a definitive answer that the W and R, the product is zero. It may be zero, it may not be zero. 292, 293. 293. Let's see what it says. Oh, 293 is very straightforward. The question is, is x equal to 1 over y? In other words, is x, x and y, or rather, not is, but rather are x and y, 
Pues sí, poco. Are they reciprocal of each other? But the first statement tells us that x times y, x times y is 1. Well, if x times y is 1, obviously, then x is equal to 1 over y. It's clear, obviously. The first statement is clearly enough. A, D, B, C, E. Since the first statement is enough, the answer cannot be B, C, or E. It would have to be either A or D. Let's see what the second statement tells us. Second statement tells us that 1 over x times y is equal to 1. That also is enough. If you multiply both sides by x, we'll find that x is equal to 1 over y. If you multiply both sides by x, I can't believe I just did that. Obviously it is enough. <coughs> Second statement, excuse me. Second statement is also enough, the answer is D. Second statement by itself is also enough. 294. Ninety-four is asking us how many out of fifty, how many out of fifty on neither neither a fax machine nor a printer. I think they should take this question out of the book in the next edition because I don't think too many young people know what a fax machine is. Let's see what they are told. The first statement tells us, the question simply is how many of them are on neither? It says total number of people who own a fax machine or a printer or both or both was less than 50 was less than 50 let's first let's first get our variable defined so we're going to use f letter f to represent the number of people number of people who own only only facts that's important let's use, let's use p which is what this is talking about number of people who own a fax machine and when they say number of people who own a fax machine they mean only a fax machine they don't say it but that's what they mean or or only a printer or both that's what they mean here so p represents the number of people who own only printer and let's use B to represent the number of people who own both and what the first statement just told us what the first statement is telling us is that F plus F plus P plus B is less than 50 is that enough to figure out how many people own neither of course not A plus A D B C E First statement by itself clearly is not enough. Simply knowing that the total number of people who own only the fax machine or not only the printer or both is less than 50 does not enable us uh, to figure out how many people own neither. The answer, a answer cannot be uh, A or D. Let's look at second statement. Second statement tells us Oh, there you go. Second statement tells us the number of people, number of, number of people who own both is exactly 15. Total number of people in the group who own both the fax machine and the print is, printer is exactly 15. Simply knowing that there are 15 people who own both a fax machine and a printer does not enable us to figure out how many people own neither, which tells us the second statement by itself is also not enough. Answer cannot be B. It would have to be either C or E, 
If we put them together, now we know that fewer than 50 people, now we know that fewer than 50 people own either only a fax machine or only a printer or both. And we know that there are 15 people exactly who own both. Again, putting them together does not tell us how many people own neither. The answer is E. How many people own neither? It's not going to do it even if we put them together. So as far as the problem is concerned, I hope you are able to see this yourself without having to do any extra work at all, because the work that we are about to do is not something you should do in the real exam. It will be a waste of time. What we're going to do now is actually draw up Venn diagram and see the two extreme scenarios, two extreme possible cases in this situation. So let's look at the two extreme cases. Here's the first one. Let's first put down the universal set. Here's the people who own the fax, only the fax machine. Here are the people who own only the printer. And here would be the both part. And here's the other extreme case. Fax, printer, and both. And we know, second statement tells us, that there are 15 people who own both. So that is given to us. That is given to us. We cannot change that. That is that we know for a fact. We also know that fewer than fewer than 50 people, fewer than 50 people. Now listen, uh, in my notes here I already put down we don't okay, yes, sorry. Fewer than 50 people own either only the fax machine or only the printer or both. 50 minus 15 is 35. We cannot have exactly 50. It has to be fewer than 50 because it's less than 50, which means up to 34 people, up to 34 people can own either a fax machine or only a fax machine or only a, up to 34. So if we use X to represent the number of people who own the fax machine, then the number of people who own a printer would be 34 minus X. This is one possibility, in which case here we have a big fat zero. This is a situation where there is nobody who owns neither. This, in this example, this zero tells us that there is, there is nobody who owns neither. Which is a bloody awkward way of saying everybody owns at least a printer or a fax machine or both. Everybody owns at least one item. Everybody owns at least one item, maybe even both. There is nobody who owns neither. This part tells you how many owns neither. Here's the other extreme scenario. Other extreme scenario is that we know there are 15 people who own both. Altogether, there has to be fewer than 50. All 34 people go here. And here is the other extreme case. In this extreme case, what this tells us is that there is nobody, there is nobody in this group who who owns only the fax machine and there is nobody who owns only the printer. People who own fax machine also own printer and there are 15 of those kind of people. Similarly, people who own the printer, if somebody tells you that I own printer, then you also know that that person also owns a fax machine because there are 15 people exactly who own both and there is and there are 34 people who do not own uh, just fax machine or just printer. If they own something, they own both or neither. There are 34 people who own neither. In this case, the question was how many people own neither? In this scenario, the answer is there are 34 people who own neither. In this case, it is zero. It could be anywhere between 34 and zero. We do not know. The answer is E. We cannot tell. The answer to this problem is E. It's impossible to figure out how many people own neither based on what we are told. There is one more. There is one more left in, the, in this column. Let's finish it up. It's taking way too long, I think. It's taking way too long. But this I hope, as, you, as I already told you, that this is not something you will do in the real exam. You just have to be able to see by looking at it that you have, we do not have enough data. We do not have sufficient data. You don't, have to, you don't have to plot it out like this. You don't have to draw it out. It takes a lot of time. The very last problem on, on the, on, on, in that column, on that page, page 295, uh, on that page, page 207, number 295. Question is, what is the value of W raised to negative 2. And that's a damn silly question. They go from one extreme to the other. Here's, here's what we are told. We are told that W raised to negative 1 equals 1 half. Well, if W raised to negative, if W raised to negative 1, we are told, equals 1 half, 
and the question is what is W also negative 2? Well just square the two things. There is your answer, W also negative 2 is equal to 1 quarter. A D B C E. First statement obviously is enough, clearly is enough. Answer cannot be B C or E. If, if it turns out that the second statement by itself is also enough, the answer would be D. Second statement tells us that W raised to 3 is equal to 8. Well, if W equals 3 is equal to 8, then W must be 2. If W is 2, then that tells us that W raised to negative 2 must be 2 raised to negative 2, which is 1 quarter. Second statement by itself is also enough. The answer is E, or rather, answer is D. And again, you should notice that we get the same answer. If you ever get conflicting, if you ever get conflicting answer from the two statements, you know that you have done something wrong because they always agree. If you work on the first statement, if you work on the first statement, you found out that Michael is 30 years old, and the second statement tells us that Michael is 28 years old. Something has gone wrong. They always agree. We're going to end here. That's the end of the page. We're going to end here. I'll see you. I'll see you tomorrow. In tomorrow's video, we'll do some multiple choice problems. All right. If you found this helpful, as I said before in the beginning of the video, if you found it helpful and if you wish to hire my services as your tutor to get you ready for the exam, you can reach me, send me an email at Keshwani Prep, P-R-E-P, Keshwani Prep at iCloud.com. Alright, bye now.